Thank you all for coming tonight. My name is Nicholas Bell. I'm the Fleur and Charles Bressler Senior Curator of American Craft and Decorative Art at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And I'm curator of the exhibition Untitled, The Art of James Castle, which opened last week and is on view on the second floor of the museum here. Uh, this show and the panel this evening are a celebration of a major acquisition of 54 works by James Castle, giving the Smithsonian the second largest public collection of his work in the world. I'm delighted to have several prominent guests here tonight. Uh, on my immediate left is Lynn Cook. Lynn is the Senior Curator for Special Projects in Modern Art at the National Gallery of Art. In her previous position as Chief Curator at the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid, she organized the 2011 exhibition, James Castle Show and Store. Next to her is Jacqueline Christ, who is Managing Partner of the James Castle Collection and Archive in Boise. Jackie has been working with James Castle's work since 1995, first uh, as director of J. Christ Gallery, and then from the last three years as, uh, with the new partnership for the collection and archive. Next to her is Frank Daldeo, who is a private art dealer and advisor in New York City. He's also a managing partner at the James Castle Collection and Archive and organized several exhibitions of Castle's work in his previous role at Nodler and Company in New York. And finally, we have Les Leslie Umberger, who is curator of self and folk taught art I'm sorry, <laughs> I knew I was gonna say that. A folk and self-taught art here at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Coming soon to you, a show called Folk Taught Art. Um, I also just wanna remind you as well to please turn off your phones. All right, so I'm gonna launch straight into questions. We're gonna talk for a little while, and then I do wanna leave plenty of time for questions this evening from the audience, because I think there's gonna be a lot to talk about. Jackie, I'd like to start with you tonight. Uh-oh, Jackie's turning off her phone, so we'll yeah. give her a minute. <laughs> that was a test, okay. okay. Uh, Jackie, it's been almost 20 years since you brought James Castle to the Outsider Art Fair in New York City in 1997, effectively reintroducing him to the mainstream art world. Um, and in those years, there has been an extraordinary pace of gathering pace, really, of exhibitions, of publications, and interest both in the United States and internationally about his work. I'm wondering what you think accounts for this expanding interest. Why does James Castle gather more and more attention? Well, I think what you're really asking is about, you know, really goes to the heart of who James, what his work is. I mean, you're really talking about the core of what, who he was and what that strikes in other people, what that, um, what that, it goes to kind of a really, I, I don't want to say spiritual, but it goes to this very deep personal space. Uh, and I think that that's what is happening. That is what it's, it has been happening over the 20 years, is that people just keep getting closer to who he was, what his work is about. So I think that that is, answers your question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Frank and Lynn, you, you've had um, quite extraordinary experiences introducing Castle to different audiences as well. Frank, first, I wonder if you can tell us about your first experience uh, encountering Castle's work and then also mm -hmm. about your efforts to really bring him into the gallery world in sure. New York. Um, my first experience with the work uh, was in, I guess, when Jackie first, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, began working with uh, John Ullman and the Fletcher Ullman Gallery in Philadelphia. And this was, I think, in 1998 or thereabouts. And um, I saw the work at the Chicago Art Fair. John was showing uh, the work featuring it. And um, he very enthusiastically you know, uh, showed me the work. And, and it didn't take long before um, he put the two of us together. And, and uh, we began uh, a conversation about it. At the time, I was working for um, Herschel and Adler Modern Gallery. and. Uh, had some experience, you know, showing the work of Bill Trailer and select other outsider artists, uh, Joseph Yoakum, Henry Dogger. At the same time, the gallery then was building a reputation for showing artists like Cy Twombly and Joseph Boyce and Sigmar Polka and Bryce Martin. And all of a sudden, you know, I was presented with this opportunity to now talk about Castle. And after handling work like Trailer, it seemed like it gave us a permission to integrate this you know, this extraordinary work into, a, you know, a more of a kind of a mainstream uh, context. So it was, a, it was a very exciting opportunity. 
What was the response like when you brought this work to Nodler? Uh, well, it was, you know, Nodler is a gallery with a long and storied history, and um, for it's showing, you know, sort of blue, trip, blue chip, if you will, brand named artists, you know, artists that come with a certain um, art world pedigree, if you will. And here I am, I'm bringing this artist, James Castle, and showing works that maybe are no bigger than a note card to someone, and they're made, they're black, <laughs> and they're made of soot, and I say, you know, this is James Castle, and he didn't go to Yale, and he didn't go to Princeton, and uh, he's from Garden Valley, Idaho. So it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily an easy sell. Um, but I think as the work was gaining traction, in the larger world, there was a show going on at the uh, drawing center at the time that was very, very highly celebrated and well attended. And um, I think heads there started to turn and recognize the, the, uh, you know, the, the important quality of the work and that it was work that, that had an undeniable quality and it needed, it needed to be seen and it needed to be seen in a, in a, um, in a very serious uh, place. On that note, Lynn, you gave Castle quite a, a serious platform to work on when you introduced his work to uh, Madrid at the Reina Sofia. Um, I think coming from Boise and then migrating to New York, Madrid is still a jump. What was the response like when you introduced his work to a European audience for the first time? I, I think one of the interesting things um, was perhaps that we didn't frame it in relation to biography. Mm -hmm. And the effort was to both show the range of Castle's work and to think about how he made these exhibitions of it himself, whether in imagination or whether in actuality isn't clear, but the drawings of the exhibitions are there. So, so it was to think about ways of showing work and also about the storage of vast amounts of work related in size or medium and so forth. And so as visitors came in, there was a lot to look at and to start unpacking the constructions and the books and the drawings and then these um, huge archival presentations. And I think the question of biography was pushed um, slightly to the side. And so people just began looking. And it's so varied and inventive and lively that it was captivating. Mm -hmm. Well, we might as well get into the meat of the whole issue, since we're talking about biography a little bit here. Uh, certainly, one of the great challenges of working with James Castle is balancing his life and his work. Leslie, you wrote a, a quite memorable line in your essay in the catalog for this exhibition. You said, quote, the enduring paradox of James Castle, the artist, is how much or how little that his selfhood should factor into an interpretation of his art. And that's something that I know that we all uh, at this table have grappled with, certainly at other museums as well. Uh, I'm thinking of the, the landmark exhibition at the Philadelphia Museum of Art in 2008 by Ann Percy, who is here tonight. Uh, how, do we, how do we navigate that in a way that is fair? No I pressure. Th I think that that is the hardest part of trying to figure it out, and it's a different answer for the museum people and non-museum people a big difference that I see. I think newcomers to it and uh, people who don't come in with a lot of preconceived notions about what art should be are very comfortable with sort of understanding the story and the art together and looking at it and trying to kind of navigate what that is. And I, I see that the art world has a little bit more of a, you know, kind of they stumble coming through the door and try to figure out how to use the tools that they've learned for looking at art and understanding where art fits in the world and trying to kind of you know, interpret Castle through this set of tools. And that makes it, in, in a way, more difficult. Um, but it seems like also biography is becoming something less taboo among all artists. It's not quite this um, topic that's not appropriate to talk about anymore, but with self-taught artists, it's often been overemphasized and really been kind of the, the leading card. And um, it's, it's fine when it's uh, being used in terms of how to make the art meaningful and how to understand it, but there's definitely too much and too little. 
and kind of, you know, threading that needle is always going to be the hard task. For those in the audience who, who know less about the history of Castle's introduction to the art world, can you talk a little bit about what too much looked like? Um, with Castle in particular? Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, always headlining it, like, um, with the deafness, the illiteracy, the, you know, all of the, um, you know, incredible seeming disabilities that this artist had that made it seem astonishing that he could have made an interesting body of work, that he had visual skills, that he could do representational perspective, that it was complex, you know, kind of the whole gamut. There was this paradox. There. His isolation, his yeah, the, the remoteness isolation. of where he was located, the emphasis or overemphasis of the his medium sometime, we over-romanticize this idea that he maybe invented his own medium, soot and spit is, you know, become a uh, part of the, of the uh, terminology we talk about when we talk about his medium and that gets sort of hyped and overly kind of celebrated. The, uh, the kinds of titles that you would see in the press, uh, Deaf Mute has art show, you know, or uh, dummy makes art and uh, it was that was unfortunately more common than uncommon in the early days mm -hmm. well and Lynn you've you've talked specifically in your catalog to the show in Madrid about progressing past that mm -hmm. uh, about the difference in showing this work in a modern art museum as opposed to even an encyclopedic museum uh, do you feel that we have, have we kind of gone over the hump? Have we gotten to a point where we can just break free from some of that history and move forward, evolving sort of in a positive way? Or is this, is this going to be a push and pull for the, for, forever with Castle? Well, hopefully not forever. Um, <laughs> but I wouldn't say that we've crossed the Rubicon. Okay. Um, I think it's, the, it's so easy to go back to those stereotypes of this remarkable work comes out of nowhere and mm -hmm. the surprise value and the isolation and the, the lack of context for understanding it. And I think it will take more significant shows that are seen by more people just to, for people to get some kind of understanding of how nuanced his play with representation was and how many forms of representation he moved through or played with simultaneously. And there isn't, in my experience, any other work, artist whose work is called self-taught or put into this box who has this range of skills or this conceptual grasp on what it means to picture. And, and in a sense, Castle figured out for himself what it is to be a modern artist and how, what a modern artist does. Like different bodies of work, plays with notions of originality and experimentation, makes shows. I mean, he did all of this uh, pretty much by working through his own whatever was to hand that he could work with. And this is, this is what's remarkable in my opinion. Mm -hmm. but, but that makes him like many other very good artists. And in some ways, to make him, to make this less singular, if singular means weird, and to make him, the, the affinities with other highly sophisticated artists, if we can make those um, connections clearer, I think we'll get to this place you're talking about. Well, and perhaps that's also being aided by his work being shown in the context of other artists. So I know that last year his work was in a major exhibition at the Viennes Biennale. Does that sort of uh, blend or blending of Castle's work into his contemporaries, even if they weren't exposed to each other directly, does that help him? Does that does that show his work in the context of, of art in a way that makes it um, perhaps easier to grasp for, for audiences? I think it depends on how appropriate the groupings are. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Jackie. I'm wondering, I, I was looking at Ann Percy's catalog from Philadelphia this morning and thinking about all of the research that she did about the factual life of Castle, all of the evidence uh, about his life, uh, reflections of his family, of his, of his friends and so forth, things that we didn't used to know for sure. It seems like she covered so much territory 
and yet we still have so many questions. How much is there that we can still learn about Castle? I mean, we will all, we will all keep talking about Castle because it's what we do, we love to do it. Um, but I wonder how much more data about Castle is there for us to go find? You might know that better than anybody. Do you mean like talking to people that, that he knew, materials? Well, uh, I was thinking about this because we, we, were, we introduced our docents at the museum to the, to the exhibition last week. And they had so many questions. How did he work? Uh, what did he know about this or that? Uh, how did he interact with, with these sources or with these people? And eventually, I had to sort of throw my, my arms up in the air and say, embrace the unknown. Because <laughs> you, you will not know. And it's okay, for, it's certainly okay for you to think about these things and to question them yourself, but don't expect that we're going to give you a sheet of answers and that you'll be able to memorize them and pass them along. But I wonder, what else is there for us to grasp on and to hold on to that hasn't already been found? Do we, I mean, it's sort of a, it's a, it's a bit of a rhetorical question, but I wonder what is there left to learn about Castle that isn't just coming from ourselves? Well, a, a little thing I think that is interesting to know about him, and I can't remember, Anne, if this was in your essay or not, sorry, but um, he uh, was uh, always very excited when people would visit, and he was very interested if they liked his work. And he would, when someone arrived at the house, he would run quick, he, and he saw them, he would run quickly, to his little cottage or a studio and he would get a picture and he would bring it and show the, the person that was visiting. And he would watch their eyes and if they, I mean, he would follow his eye, their eyes down to the picture he was holding out and he would uh, just, he would watch, and if they pushed him away or they weren't interested, he never showed them a picture again. He never forgot and they never got to see another picture. Mm -hmm. And so he was, he really uh, felt it, it, I think what I take away from that is that he was really, he was really proud of what he did. He knew what he did uh, was interesting, at least to him and to a lot of people that he did get to show the work to. So um, he was very engaged and, uh, but he was also extremely private. Mm -hmm and he didn't like for people to go into his studio. He would get very, very upset. He never took anyone into his studio. If they did go in, he would become hysterical. And uh, it was a very, very private pra place. That's where he set up the exhibitions that, that um, Lynn talks about in Show and Store and um, uh, that he depicted in his uh, drawings. He, um, was uh, very funny. He loved a lot of, he had a lot of uh, things that he laughed about. He, he thought he was funny when he did certain things like run the milk separator and spray everybody with milk. He thought it was hilarious, <laughs> you know, and he knew when he did things that he shouldn't do, you know, uh, and uh, he, he always wanted his turn to wash dishes and uh, if his sister had gotten some new drinking glasses, uh, you knew that some of those were going to get broken the first day because that was the day he would wash the dishes and when he, no one was looking, he'd break them and he'd put all the pieces of glass in his pocket and <laughs> that became part of his collection. Um, he uh, was very engaged with the family. Um, he uh, watched over the kids and uh, he knew exactly when certain TV shows came on, and he uh, was the first to get to sit on the sofa. There was not enough seating in the family home. It was a very, very small home with four children, and, uh, and uh, so he would be on the sofa before anybody else got to, so he could watch TV. And so he was a pretty regular guy, you know, in a lot of ways. He found humor. He, he uh, had compassion. I could tell you many stories about uh, the what the neighbors told me about how compassionate he was. So he really was a regular guy who actually, you know, got to make art every day. And the, all the neighbors and the family, they all saved um, um, his, the 
found papers, and every morning there would be uh, a pile of papers that his sister had saved from food containers, and it was always on the same place in the counter. Neighbors saved paper and uh, cartons and things. Um, Jerry, his uh, uh, niece, his eldest niece, said that, you know, she used to, she had a real estate business, and so she would um, uh, stop by the house, and uh, she had, you know, it was the days when women wore those clip-on earrings, and she always had these beaded clip-on earrings, and she would take one off to use the phone because she ran her real estate business out of a payphone at a cafe, and so when she'd stop by uh, her mother's house where James lived, uh, she would take an earring off, and she didn't even realize that James was there, and he would steal the earring. And then when he died, they found all kinds of jewelry and things, you know, and his stuff, and because they were pretty, and he didn't, you know, he wasn't trying to be, do anything bad or anything. And um, the family was always giving him money, and uh, he, they thought that when he died and they went through his stuff, they would find thousands of dollars from having all the family members that gave him money. And what, um, there wasn't a single dollar in his stuff, and which has made, as I've always wondered if he used the green, if he could get the green out of those early dollar bills for his colored pulp work. You know, so he was, he, to me, he was a master of field expediency and, um, <laughs> and uh, just very clever, very clever guy. <laughs> from, uh, from the point of view of furthering his biography and, and uh, filling in more facts, I, I, I think, I'm not sure, there's m maybe much, much more to learn. Um, the kind of research that Anne did at Philadelphia has, you know, certainly advanced that and, and others, but... One thing I can say as someone who's had the privilege of being able to assemble uh, more than one exhibition of his work and to look deeply at the work is the work continually tells us more. It's almost inexhaustible in my, in my view. I think every time you turn a new leaf and you, and you uh, encounter a, a different series or body of work of his, you see something new in it or something undiscovered or something you haven't encountered before about about pattern, about design, about the use of text, about architecture, about how to make a construction. Now, I, I think the real uh, lesson, so to speak, or what's more to learn about castles is right in the work, and it's sort of our challenge to do, follow his example in, in the sense that he's someone who looked in a very sustained way and keenly observed his environment, and if, if we pay attention try to follow that you know, way of looking at his work, there, there's much, much to be learned about, I think, his castle and, and his world. I'm curious what body of work by castle is dearest to each of your hearts, because they are so different, and they, people react to them very differently. That's a great question. <laughs> Whoever wants to jump in there. Um, it's, I'd be almost hard-pressed to tell you uh, which body of work uh, or aspect of his work is most dear to me. I think his drawings are, are uh, of an exceptional quality, clearly. Um, and yet, you know, I think in a show like what you did, Len, in Madrid, I saw for the first time this, this body of very sort of almost painterly washes, almost abstractions that, that I thought were sublime and that seemed to come almost from another mind and another hand entirely. And so I thought those were, you know, like most of what he does, it's just entirely convincing and, um, and profoundly moving. So I, I, I really am, am hard pressed to tell you which, which, ones, which body of work I'm uh, How about you, Leslie? I, I, I love the constructions because I love the idea that he actually, you know, built those up and compiled them and that they're just, they're, they're from whole cloth. You know, they're absolutely put together. And, um, and incredibly unique and just there's sometimes when you encounter one and it's just so highly personal. It's um, just like this little treasure. But I think the pieces that make me appreciate him as 
an artist the most are the pieces where I'm very aware of his perspective, the drawings, um, the really circuitous perspectives, kind of meandering through, through doorways, out windows, or doors upon doors, you know, scenes opening onto scenes, and this way he just unfolds space and kind of folds it back, but always puts it um, so that you feel like you and he are standing in one place. Very, very powerful thing that he, that he has the ability to do. That you could feel him. You mm -hmm. feel him. I've, um, I think it's hard for me to say uh, what uh, if there's a particular body of work or kind of work that is my favorite. Um, there is, a, but rather maybe an idea, a particular kind of way of working where he, um, in the portraits of the little figures, for example, that you'll see in the exhibition, um, there are little figures that always stand next to certain other figures. And uh, sometimes when he's zeroing in on a particular group of figures, he may not have the room in the way that he's established the uh, the picture, uh, and is so, but he knows, he remembers that in another drawing he showed this other little figure, and with that, with the, with the little black-haired girl, and so then you will see maybe just a hand on the side of the, of the space, the picture space. You'll see just a hand, because he knows that that person, that figure, is always there. And so it's those, that incredible, intense, phenomenal memory that he had for the way that he would organize these images, this kind of photographic memory, and this, uh, this selection, this way that he selected those moments where he would stay true to what he was depicting, and then overlay that with what his memory told him, or what he thought may look better in the in the picture. So it's it's for me it's it's the, those moments that kind of take me to my knees with his work, mm -hmm. and that 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 phenomenal that phenomenal memory of his. Mm -hmm. Lynn, it's very hard to say, but I think one of the things I point to is is the visual wit. And sometimes it's in the drawing Leslie was um, talking about where the door opens on the door or opens on another door and the play of spatial recession is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. But it's in the constructions too. And if you put together 10 coats, you'll notice that the lapels are different or the, the buckles go and the belts go out differently. <laughs> He's got such a careful observation and such a pleasure in looking at clothes and mm -hmm. playing around with the the details of lapels and buttons and all, all those kind of niceties that distinguish one coat from another. Or in some of the jugs, they are life size and you see one in profile and then you look at the other side because they're two sided and you realize that the, the handle which should be coming at you is a strip so it's been foreshortened mm -hmm. to count for the position you are looking at when you're looking at it. That kind of thing is mm -hmm. just, it's, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. The, the visual cues, like with the, with the, uh, the picture that you're talking about, with uh, constructions that depict objects that have volume, he would always use these little squares of cardboard or paper sewn on top of each other, and um, a very different kind of technique when he would maybe make a coat, there'd be a different way of making that coat and um, so he had a, uh, a very well established of the, the kind of system of these visual cues that I, I agree with you. <laughs> uh, each of you has been integral to the process over the last couple of decades of bringing whole new audiences effectively to James Castle's doorstep to bringing people that aren't familiar with his work and may not have had any interaction with the region 
to that region through his eyes and to his experience of the world. And in that sense, each of you has been an integral player in creating and crafting a legacy for him, which of course will always stand on the work first. But I wonder, what does the end of this project look like? How long do we do this before we achieve a state where we're satisfied with James Castle's position in the world? What do we want out of this? Just a light question before dinner. <laughs> To walk into the prints and drawings department in the British Museum and see his work along there oh, with would be nice. Jasper Johns or Rembrandt, or mm. Mm. it could easily. Could, I mean, it would. Uh, it could. Mm. Shall I say what I said again? Um, one one anecdotal answer to that would be to walk into the prints and drawings um, department of the British Museum, one of the greatest holdings of prints and drawings in the world and to see castle drawings alongside Rembrandt drawings and Jasper John's drawings, along with everything else. That would be a marker. I'd like to see him make it into the American art kind of you know, history books and be understood as um, an, an artist who ranks among any that the country has ever seen and that he's worth talking about in depth as an artist of great merit and um, intentionality and uh, intelligence and, and have that be taken seriously. That would be, that would be great. Yeah, I would only add to that just a, just a broad and, and sort of universal recognition uh, of his, I think, supreme achievement as an, as an artist. Um, uh, I think is is a place that he rightly deserves, and and I and I think the day will will arrive when that happens. It's interesting because what you're all essentially saying is that we've reached the end of the road when he's fully integrated into a, a canon that already exists, and yet at the same time, for me, his work is a challenge. To, to that whole structure that we all want to see him become a part of. And, and in a sense, perhaps being able to introduce him to these collections, to these museums, to these audiences, is a way to break down a little bit some of the walls, not, not just through introducing him to it, mm -hmm. but actually pulling some of the attention away from the exclusivity of that, of that model. What, what, in your view, is the biggest part of that challenge, would you say? Hmm. Sorry to throw it You're back not supposed at, to ask the, at the questions. moderator. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Lynn, I, I wanted actually to put you on a spot just for a moment. Um, uh, but but I, I heard just in, in one sentence, I heard about what you're working on at the National Gallery at Nile. And it sounds like it actually relates to this question, which is uh, sort of an analysis of how mainstream and self-taught art integrate or overlap or what their relationship is to each other. And without looking for a lot of detail, I'm wondering if you can just tell us broadly about that. It's a show that uh, looks at that interface between self-taught in the widest sense and the mainstream in the US in the 20th century. And this breaks down into different historical moments with different role models or paradigms for the self-taught. Sometimes folk, sometimes outsider, naive visionary and so forth. But the ending part, the last part of it, is um, takes up the question which is really coming from the professional art world, the, the mainstream contemporary art world and has been coming from the mid 90s onwards, really at the time that institutions dedicated to folk and self-taught art took over stewardship of this from the Museum of Modern Art and the Whitney. Formerly, the work had been shown in those institutions, not necessarily integrated, but certainly mm -hmm. presented there. And now it has its own dedicated art world. But the mainstream art world is saying, why? What, what value have these categories and distinctions? Why don't we um, get rid of these classificatory systems and start putting everyone without label on an even playing field? Well, there are obviously many advantages in this. There may be some disadvantages too, but that's the question. So when and how would this be appropriate? That's mm -hmm. sort of okay. the crux of the show in its, 
in that's its a, final that's a big stages. Bite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we've all yes, Jackie. Well, I just I wanted to add something that um, you know when you um, going back to the question mm -hmm. two questions ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I think that that absolutely I'd love to see. I, I'm totally on board with where you would like to see the work at, with the in the British Museum and what you know everyone said. And I think that one of the ways for that I we will see that happen more is that when we see Castle integrated into thematic exhibitions in major museums, that you know it has been the impulse, I think, since Castle's work first was introduced about 20 years ago, it, is that even, even a lot of in the galleries when they do shows or in the museums, they do kind of retrospective type looks at Castle and the, and the impulse because the work is so deep is you want to show so much of what he did. It's like the book and the construction and, and, these, and there's just so many ideas. And so every, people want to show as much Castle work as they can. But I think when, um, but, but I have thought that when Castle starts to, um, his work starts to be considered by curators um, uh, as a way of helping develop specific ideas or notions. And um, so uh, I think that the, because what that does is it gives um, the opportunity for a broader dialogue. Right now, when you see a one-person exhibition of Castle, while wow, it just knocks your socks off, you know, it, at the same time, uh, to be able to see how Castle's work stands next to the masters. And I think, like, like you said, Lynn, you know, just to, to hang next to Jasper and to the, the, the other great known artists, um, but that, I don't think we're going to see that until we see more inclusion in thematic exhibitions. Uh, so that's just an idea I have.